Uh, stream should be up now. Yep. Yeah, I can see it. It's all good. Um. Oh, the. Oh, wait. No, sorry. I'm just. I was gonna say the. Uh, thing was weird, but I was just scrolled down the page, so I couldn't see it all. Okay. What did you work on? Um. So. Uh. Not a heap over the weekend. Um. I sort of felt like I was possibly nearing burnout type stuff, so I um, didn't put too much pressure on myself over the weekend. Um, I was working this morning on some of the, like, or on some goal stuff that we talked about at the end of last session. Uh, yeah, which I've written a bit about. Um, I sort of, I mean, well, written a bit about, that's, yeah, a generous description. Um, I started writing about some stuff and sort of didn't, uh, I don't know, felt like I was sort of not, it wasn't easy sort of thing. Um, anyway, I worked on the article, I linked below that a bit. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. I don't know. I, yeah, I felt a bit like I wasn't quite sure what. Um, I should write about bigger stuff sort of compared to last time like was it just not detailed or that sort of thing um, and then there's like a sort of I don't know a bit of a feeling in general of regression maybe I'm not quite sure um, anyway yeah oh yeah that reminds me one of the things I was thinking is that you should probably do some Based repetition practice of things we've done before. Are you familiar yep. with that concept? Uh, no, I haven't heard those that term before. It sort of sounds intuitive, but yeah. Yeah, so you just practice things based out over time, and you increase the time the more times you do it, assuming that you get it right. Yeah. So you have like an exponential decay on how often you practice it. Yeah, so I was thinking a bit about that sort of stuff because, um, uh, like, I noticed, like, if I'm sitting down to try and write something now, I don't go through the steps that I did before, um, like brainstorming and stuff. Uh, so yeah, so I think that's I think that's probably good. Um, I also like haven't done any grammar analysis in a month or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So keeping up some practice on those things should be good. Uh, let's try to get a list of a few of the things. You should work on so there's grammar trees there's um text analysis trees and in particular um writing down the connections between different ideas like how they relate to each other we worked on that for a while yep um yeah that's something that i haven't really kept in mind um even during recent text analysis stuff we've done. Um, one thing uh, that I'm, I've sort of like done a bit is uh, like in terms of the media that I've consumed in general, uh, I've been looking out for like social stuff or at least noticing them and like writing down occasionally, but I feel like I should do some more analysis. Um, uh, maybe Maybe go through the puppet strings thing again. Because I haven't done that in some time, um, and there's a good body of work around it. Uh, but yeah, I'm sort of like I'm worried that I am missing things again, or like, uh, yeah, doing stuff that I don't know why I'm doing it, but socially motivated or whatever. I'm not certain that I'm doing that, but I'm worried that I will again. Yeah, I I don't think you should view that stuff primarily as again. Like, partly there's maintaining what you already learned, but I think also these were all things that we started on, but I wouldn't call them totally complete. There was still room to learn more by working on them more, rather mm -hmm. than only maintenance. Yep, no, that's a good point. Um, yeah, the writing practice, um, in general, I'm going to add to the list as well. Yeah.
And there's, um, there's making trees as a way to outline and think through topics, which can be done as yeah. a free writing thing, potentially. There's also, like, debate trees and um, putting the debate into the tree to understand what happened better. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, then there's stuff that's a little harder to practice. Like, it's less clear what you do to practice it, but there's stuff like yes, no, and pass forward and overreaching, which you could review in some way. Like, I don't know if you've read all of the articles related to pass forward yet, but that's a way of reviewing. No, I haven't, yeah. Um... Yeah, I think as, like, the past few weeks, I've sort of um, taken on some stuff again and, uh, like, other work, and it's, some of it's, like, moderately time-sensitive, which means that I've, like, put, uh, like, whenever I have a chance to, or a comparison between doing that and, like, FI stuff, uh, it's hard to prioritize the FI stuff unless I'm, like, going out of my way to do a certain amount of time or, or something like that. Um, yeah, that's a fairly common thing, and I think it's a problem people have, where they view some things as urgent and other things as not urgent, and they have the two categories, and then FI stuff often ends up in the not urgent category because they're not under direct immediate pressure to do it with like a clear deadline or something. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think putting people under immediate pressure, like, you have to do this FI stuff by next week, you know, read Atlas Shrug this month, is unnecessary and, like, extra pressuring. Yeah, um, particularly, I mean, it's it's a it's a problem that, like, if the solution to, oh, I'm bad at prioritizing stuff, is, like, introducing deadlines, then it's a, like, a, it's a compounding issue in that you've got to introduce more deadlines to prioritize stuff more effectively and, and so on and so on. Um, so it doesn't really solve the problem at all. Yeah, so FI is not urgent on a timeline of a couple days or even a couple weeks. However, it is urgent. Like, it is the sooner the better. It makes a difference whether you improve those skills now or later. If you just wait a year or two, you know, that makes a difference in your life. There's a downside to that. Yeah. It's different than, say, chess. If you're going to take up chess as a hobby, you could do that right now, but you could also do it two years from now, and there wouldn't particularly be a downside to starting two years later. Yeah, I unless I had some some goal like winning it winning the grand championship but before, or within the next decade. Like, it's easy to, unless, like, I add a time yeah. component, but yeah, but with FI stuff, it's because it affects, like, everything in life. Um, there right. is, like, yeah. With chess, like, you know, it might help you think a little bit. You can get some benefits from it that apply to other stuff, but that's the same with pretty much everything you do. Whatever you do now, it might help you a little bit with whatever you do later. Um, however, with philosophy, uh, it, it does that in a larger way, so it's more urgent than typical activities. So is the solution to this just like allocating time, like time boxing type stuff? I mean, time boxing, not that, but yeah. That's one of the solutions. You could do that. Um, but you can also do like a mindset shift where like you won't prioritize it over emergencies um, and you won't like force it on, at really bad times, but you can treat it as urgent in general. like against other urgent things that don't have an immediate deadline and there's no disaster and so on, you could treat it as sort of equal priority. Yeah, so I think, like, this mindset shift, um, so, I like, I feel like there's, um, 
like I go through periods of more and less. I, I mean, I don't know if the actual dissatisfaction changes, but um, it sort of changes in how I feel about it. Uh, of like, I don't know, yeah, satisfaction with myself, sort of thing, with my choices and my actions and what I choose to put effort into or how effective I am at doing stuff um, has something to do with it as well. Um, and I mean, I've had a decent, like, I've had a mind shift, um, a mindset shift over the past few months, but yeah, I don't feel like I'm, I don't know, all the way to where I want to be, I guess, in that regard. It's weird to think about that I'm like conscious of wanting to change things uh like on the one level i'm i'm like want to get better and do more philosophy but on the other level i'm apparently i'm willing to actually spend time doing it yeah there's sort of like a conflict there i guess like um did you mean not willing something. uh yeah if i didn't say that then yeah that like i'm apparently not willing to do it um in that i don't go out of my way to or it's it's Sorry, even going out of the way is maybe the wrong way to think about it. Like, I don't choose to do it when I've got the opportunity a lot of the time. Yeah, so part of this stuff is if it's more of a habit and you, like, remember it as an option more often, that also helps. I am um, improving some stuff around habits. Um, it's, um, yeah, not not amazing sort of thing, but but I am generally getting more more happy with that, like uh like daily routine stuff and whatever else. That's good at least. Yeah, I try to do writing stuff in the morning in general, and I think that would work best for people on average because you're fresher in the morning, and philosophy is often uh, on the hard side mentally. Yeah. Over some people like have a hard time in mornings and wake up later in the day so it's not really the same for everyone and a lot of people like if their work starts at nine they don't want to wake up early enough to do significant other stuff first so it can be like they have to shift their sleep cycle to something they're not comfortable with like 10 p.m to 6 a.m or something yeah i mean i also find it's difficult to it's more difficult to move your sleep cycle uh like forward in the day than it uh like to wake up earlier than it is to wake up later um which i yeah, so i have trouble yeah sometimes maintaining it um but yeah in general i feel like i'm pretty slow to wake up which oh, I yeah, particularly I, like i don't just jump into writing i usually check things on my phone for like half an hour and then go start writing. I yeah. have some wake up time. Um, so in the philosophy section, um, other things to put there are overreaching. And also we talked about scheduling, resource budgets, buffers, and procrastination and motivation. And yeah. yes, so those are less clear how you practice them, but you can review them and try to keep them in mind more often so that they don't just get lost. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel like the, the way to practice this sort of stuff is, um, uh, so keeping them in mind is important. And then it's like the practice moment is every time that you make a choice, that's different from what you would have made otherwise, essentially. Um, yeah, you can go through days or parts of days very intentionally, like thinking through uh, each of your choices and why you're doing it. And then if you're doing it in a more conscious way, you have a lot more opportunity to use your ideas about these things instead of being on autopilot. And that helps you practice actually using them. Yeah, yep. Yeah. One of the things I noticed as well, just looking at the list and thinking about this, um, so stuff like, uh, 
in terms of like writing practice interacting with the other stuff here um a lot of this i could do like i i don't know there's a feeling of laziness maybe of like in terms of i could use a bunch of these techniques to analyze stuff that i've written to figure out whether it's good or not or whether it has problems um yep yeah and i and i don't but i wonder if it's good or not still um yeah, that feels like a mindset thing. Yeah, you can also use writing to work on the other stuff by writing about it. Like you can write stuff about paths forward or scheduling or something. And if you write about them frequently, it'll help you think through them and understand them better. That's a lot of what I do with those things is I'll repeatedly write different articles about them to think through them more and look at them in different ways and so on. Uh, yeah, I know there's this word internalize that feels somewhat appropriate. I'm not quite sure how. Yeah, like... and internalizing is one of the things, one of the goals. Um, it's similar to making it more, feel more natural and intuitive, which is related to habit and autopilot. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, so another thing you can, that's not on the list is reading. So there's working on reading in general and making it a habit, and then there is at some point, reading more Goldrat and Rand and Popper and so on. I probably have a bunch of articles you haven't read as well in the archive. Yeah, no, there definitely are. Um, uh, even just related to this stuff, there are. Um, I've been thinking about that a bit. I've um, uh, been making some slow progress through the choice again, um, which is good. Like, I'm happy that I'm making some progress, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's um, I sort of wonder how relevant some of the business stuff is to the philosophy and attitude side of the choice. Uh, I guess it's, you know, they've got a, a market and a segment that they're aiming for and things, um, and a skill set slash context with which they're discussing it. But, um, but yeah, I, I thought sometimes the examples bored. worked well. Like, I, I thought... You need examples of some sort. You could have used other examples, but I thought business was fine. And in a couple yeah. places, I thought it was particularly suitable. There was some reason that it fit the, the criteria well. Um, the other thing I was going to mention was, um, I think I saw Anne and Justin discussing in tutoring the other day. Uh, was it tutoring? Anyway, wherever it was, about... Um, uh, reading Atlas Shrugged and not putting too much like pressure on oneself about doing a first pass. Uh, like, yeah, this section. Um, anyway, so that's sort of like uh, taken a bit of pressure off, I feel like, from because um... it's one of those books I wanted to read, but it's big, so I feel like I need to be like prepared for a trek or something as opposed to just treating it like any other book and getting into it and not worrying too much about getting everything the first time. Yeah. It's, anyway, so that it's not hard. Like some big books are cause it's a novel. It's not like reading a thousand page textbook where things fit together. Or like if you took BOI and you made it three times longer and the chapters are linked together, um, you know, nonfiction sort of tends to get harder as it gets longer. Yeah. Whereas Atlas Shrugged, like, it's not particularly harder to read than Fountainhead. It's just the story keeps going further. The exception yeah. being Galt's speech, um, which is like 75 pages or something of basically nonfiction. That's, that's sort of okay, though. Like, I mean... But yeah, it's, it's just not... one section. It's not super long for a book. Yeah. Um... Do you know how many pages Atlas Shrugged has overall? Or like by the 75 page metric? Oh, like 1500. Those are just loose 
Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, no, I just wanted to get a sense of proportion was all, because otherwise I don't know what the 75 yeah. pages necessarily means. Obviously, it's not A4 pages. Um, yeah, I weird. think it's... Yeah. I think it's definitely less than 10% of the book. Uh, well, it, if it was 1,500 pages, it'd be about 5%. So yeah, that sounds yeah. about right. There are 10 um, chap. There's there's 10 chapters per section. There's 30 total chapters. And it's uh, it's on the long side. So more than 130th. Yeah, okay. Which also fits. So yeah, maybe it's only 5%. But that's... um. I mean, I'm just thinking about the audiobook length. If the whole book was 60 hours, that's still like a three-hour speech at that speed. Is it? Is that right? Three hours is definitely 5% of yeah. 60. Yeah. Um, I mean, it sounds a lot longer yeah. putting it like that. The three-hour yeah. speech spoken slowly totally fits with it. It's quite long. Mm. That's, um, yeah. It's much, much longer than every other speech that she's written. Like, there's a couple of speeches in Fountainhead, but none of them are terribly long. And Atlas Shrugged has the same thing, where there's some similar length, small speeches. There's just the one extra big one. Yeah, I don't think there were even, like, the speeches in Fountainhead were more than a few pages. Like, there's the courthouse speech. Um, yeah, the courtroom one might be the longest one, I'm not sure. But from memory, that's not... Yeah, that's not particularly long. It's sort of, it's reasonably detailed, but it's not like yeah, particularly yeah. crazy. There's a lot of um, uh, assumed knowledge at that point that sort of goes into it. Um, in terms of the book, a lot of stuff we're already familiar with. Okay, so about the urgency, I had two other ideas. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. There's one other one I'm trying to remember. Well, maybe I'll remember later. So, the better you understand the problems, the more clearly you see, like, X is turning out worse for me because I don't know why. Like, you see what you're missing, the more you're going to be motivated. Yeah. Sometimes, I don't know, yeah, like, um, I think it's probably somewhat common that, uh, like, I feel like there's a negative incentive sort of thing, or like, pressure against doing stuff sometimes um even though the outcomes might be like objectively good uh they like like because you know doing the stuff will imply a uh, sorry uh, imply um will like create more work for you down the road or like sort of like afraid like afraid of being great because of what that requires i guess is the short way of saying it um which in and of itself is then a problem. Uh, do you think you have that problem? Like, is there something about it that scares you or worries you? Sometimes. Um, not all the time. Like, it's a... Is there something concrete that you're worried about? Like, losing friends or not fitting in or... No, no, no. I think, I think the, like, the concrete thing is just the amount of work. Like, which is... I mean, why does it feel like work? Um, Go, going down the path of learning stuff is not a commitment to keep going any particular amount. Like it doesn't sign you up for future work. Oh, sorry. I meant um, I meant stuff like flux, for example. Um, like oh. not doing things as well as I could, because if like uh, if I fail at it, then it's easy to like there's there's low requirements. It's easy to keep doing it or whatever else. Um, Whereas if we succeed at it, then there's like all this stuff that needs to happen then. Um, oh, I see. If Flex takes off, then you'll take on new responsibilities and stuff. Yeah. And in general, like it feels like the amount of work would increase. 
Yeah, pre presumably that sounds rewarding to you, or you wouldn't be doing flux. Like, would be my initial expectation. Yeah, it's maybe the way to describe it is like the result is rewarding, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm looking forward to the journey. Uh, see, I was thinking that if you're doing flex, you would probably want those particular problems. That particular situation would sound good to you. Like, if flex takes off, then I'll make enough money from flex. I don't need a different job and I can focus on this fun stuff more. You know, that's usually one. what would one what one would hope would be an attitude someone had to a hobby or a voluntary optional thing is that if it took off more um they'd like it more than their standard work or some of the other things they do otherwise why are yeah. you doing it yeah no i so that sort of thing is like that's the case the the conflict i think is is between like that on one side and then uh i don't know like um I don't know, an easy life, I guess, is sort of... The th I don't know how else to... Like, what else it could be, really. Uh, um, well, it feels entirely play. like an attitude. Yeah, I mean, that's the that's a, uh, that's a less satisfying, then. It's sort of... Um, but I mean, yeah, I don't... You're, not, you're not forced into it. If, if, you, no. if you try it for a while and you're like, you know what, I just want to relax on a beach, um, you can switch. Yeah, um, and I mean, I do take breaks and stuff, and there are periods where not much happens. Um, I don't know. I guess the like the it feels like a a particularly stupid sort of conflict. I guess um, it's like the desire to be on the beach all the time. Um, you probably get bored of it. That's actually something a lot of people don't test and don't have experience with. Is how like stir crazy they go if they actually got rid of all their obligations, like. Some people, they sort of mm. wait until they retire, and then they retire, and then, like, after a year, they're bored. Yeah, yeah. And they're like, oh, this is what I was looking forward to, and now I'm not even having fun. Like, they don't actually know what to do with themselves other than their work. That's pretty common. Yeah. Um, um, so, but taking breaks can give you some perspective. Like, if I didn't write for two weeks, I would be very antsy and want to write something. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's maybe like so I don't think this mind this uh yeah, mindset slash attitude sort of thing. Uh I don't think it's like new and it comes and goes, but um and I think like I think I'm getting better, but uh like is in more consistent in my mindset. But um yeah, it just still feels there, I guess, is why I raise it. It's still a thing that occurs to me sometimes. Okay, so about urgency. Um, seeing from yourself is motivating. So, for example, if you're a parent and your child was crying on a daily basis, that would motivate you to write about TCS and ask questions and stuff more urgently until you manage to rationalize it and decide all children cry. That's just what children do. And then you might lose the motivation. But there would at least in the short term be a conflict where you think that crying is bad and it's happening all the time, so you're going to be, like, it's such a concrete, blatant problem that you would be motivated unless you actually manage to give up and blind yourself to it. Um, so you can see problems that are a little more subtle than that in other parts of your life. Like, you try to write something and it doesn't come out very well. Or you try to have a discussion with people and there's miscommunication. Or um, you try to plan to do a bunch of things and then some of them don't happen. And there must have been a scheduling issue. Stuff like that. Or just like you make a bunch of choices and you're like, I think my choices could have been better. Um, but it's like, it, it's not always easy to concretize that. Like having sort of a sense that you're, you could have made better choices and actually knowing if I learned this, then I would have gotten Y benefit are different. Um, one is more abstract than the other. Like the better I am, the better things will go. It's not as motivational as if I knew this decision tech making technique, I would have avoided this particular bad outcome. Yeah. Yeah. So if you work on understanding the things better, it can increase motivation as you see how much they apply and how important they are more. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with that. Um, yeah. And so that's the thing you can do intentionally is throughout your day, you can come up with several examples of places where some extra skill would have been useful. Like, if only I knew yes, no better, it would have been helpful here. Or now I have to make a scheduling decision. If I had studied buffers more, that would be useful right now. Stuff like that. Yeah. If you can try to identify specific times that there's something you could have learned that would help, it will remind you to learn things. Yeah. I feel like um, reflecting on that is not something that I do particularly often. Um, I guess it's related to like postmortems and stuff as well. But even like identifying those, because there's lots of like soft mistakes, I guess we make. Um, yeah. Like that aren't fatal. So like if I, instead of, you know, following the documentation for some programming thing, I just like jumped into it and it ended up taking three hours instead of two. That's something that I actually have like identified and been working on though. Um, to try and do a bit more prep before I dive into code stuff, because it's uh, it's not uncommon that I'll feel like I've wasted time in that way. Yeah, you can you can understand these things more if you approach things you're going to do in a more purposeful, conscious way. If you write down things like, uh, what is the goal of this project? What are the prerequisites? What resources is it going to use up? Um, what is my budget? Uh, and you do all these planning steps, it helps make it clear. You can say like what things would be useful and make this project go better and you can brainstorm a list of things. And if you go through this sort of conscious philosophical process, um, you'll be able to see more clearly both that methodology, methodology can be helpful and also specifically like if you're listing, what are all the things that would, would help get a better outcome on this project? Some of them will be philosophy related, like skills. Yeah. You can do like a wishful thinking list. Like, you know, if only I could do this, then that would be really useful for the project. If only I could do this. And then you can go through your wishful thinking list and be like, are there any of these that maybe I could acquire in the near future before I do the project? Um, and sometimes some of them will actually be realistic in some way. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, that makes sense. Okay, the other one I forgot earlier was a lot of the issue with urgency stuff, I think, is having an overbooked schedule. Um, if your schedule is too full, then it sort of pushes things off. And even if you see stuff as semi-urgent, it can get pushed off. Whereas if your schedule felt like semi-open, like you have a little bit of extra time, then it might be quite a bit easier to fit some FI stuff in or some reading or whatever. Yeah. So there's a very strong trend in our culture of overbooking schedules. So that's, that's the default, is that people put too many things on their schedules so that it doesn't all get done. And the, the goal should be to book around two thirds of your waking hours at most and have one third flex time. Yep. And it's, but people actually, what they do is they try to book 100% of their available time and then they actually overbook it more than that. Like they'll book 120%. But even if you book 100%, it's never going to work. There's going to be variance. And also, people tend to underestimate um, how long things take on average. I think underestimates yeah. are more common than overestimates when you're doing your own schedule. Maybe it goes the other way when your boss asks you how long something takes. Yes, yeah, yep. Yeah. And uh, you're like, oh, that'll but... take a month. I need a whole month. Yeah. Uh, no, I definitely feel like people do that. I mean, I, I think I tend to underestimate both. Um, though I haven't worked in a job where I feel like particularly like awful about it or something or wanting to waste time. I haven't wanted to waste time. Yeah, for, hold on a sec. For There's a while. an audio glitch. I'm going to try again. 
Hello. Is that better? Uh, the audio quality is still kind of bad. Try leaving the channel and rejoin. Yep. So I just rejoined. Is this any? Is this okay? No. Like I can, uh, I can sort of hear you. I can make out the words, but it's pretty awful quality. Um. It just started. Yeah, it just started a second ago. I'm gonna add a second looking here, bud. Looking at sec uh, Discord options, but I don't see anything super relevant. No change with two earbuds. Okay. Um. I can try a different mic. That might do something. Yeah, we could try Zoom as well. I'll uh, I'll mute Daphne, and you can try saying something on Zoom. Uh. Uh, testing. Yeah. The audio is still glitchy. Is it, I wonder if there's a bandwidth problem. Um, does this still sounds average, does it? Yeah, so bad. All right. I might, I'll restart Discord. Um, okay, is this, this isn't any better, is it? No change. I got, uh, 475 down, 35 up on my speed test, so it seems normal and fine. And it's the download that's relevant on my end, so that's definitely be a problem. I wonder whether, um, like, latency maybe is doing a thing? I should, I should change headphones. Let me get something else. Um, oh. Oh. oh, yeah, my headphones are connected, so it's open mic at the moment. Um, I was just going to say, I listened to my voice on the stream and it sounded okay. Is that that was like you? 40 seconds ago, so I think it's probably headphones, right? Oh, okay. Uh, I can hear you now. It sounds better. I think somehow my AirPods glitched. Cool. Um, it might have just been like the different Bluetooth power modes and stuff like that. That could be something like that might be it. Okay. Um... We're back. Where were we? Um, I think talking about scheduling. Yeah. Um, oh, I think I was saying that I tend to underestimate, but like both, you know, when giving someone a project estimate as well as um, as well as personal stuff. Um, I try more to to increase project estimates by like some factor to avoid that. Um, yeah, yeah. A lot of people learn their lesson a bit when they're making commitments to other people. Yeah. 
I'll be like, oh, that'll that, that's easy. That'll take like a day. Um, and then it takes like three days. The core of it takes a day, and then there's like two days of polish and stuff. Yeah, um, sometimes it's, it's an eighty twenty rule problem, where like you got when you think of the project, you think about sort of the main points, which end up only taking twenty percent of the time, and then the yep. the polish and the details and the little picky things that seem not that important end up taking like a lot of the time. Yeah, no, I think um I think that's sort of it. Maybe maybe I should just multiply by five. Let's we'll see if that that solves it. Um, yeah, the eighty twenty rule is not super accurate. By the way, that's something Goldrat points out. Is Goldrat says that Pareto told everyone and knew himself that the eighty twenty rule is an estimate when things are independent. However, if you have dependencies, then it changes and it's no longer as good of an estimate. And Goldratt's point is if you have a lot of dependencies, um, you can actually get more like a 99-1 rule, or even more extreme, where only 1% or fewer things are the major causes of most of the stuff going on. Yeah, I could see that. I, particularly in stuff like, um, like fulfilling a government contract, um, things like that could easily fall into that sort of category. Um, where you end up, yeah, with a, the like way over like over 90% being dealing with um routine stuff as opposed to doing the core of the work. But yeah. One thing I was thinking about this was um so there's in terms of like uh buffer stuff. So if we have a rule like one third of your time should be flex time, then you end up with different amounts of flex time depending on when you whether you think about scheduling like office hours or waking hours, um, even just like practical waking hours, for example. Um, yeah, so I think it's good to split it up by major categories. Like if you have a work life and a home life, then you can take how much time to have each of those and do one third of each of those should be buffer. Like give them separate buffers because you don't want to interchange time between them. Yeah, so that, yeah, like actually time boxing, um, that sort of stuff. Yeah, that makes I mean, sense. That's, that's um, often reasonably clear cut. Like, if you work forty hours a week, then you can schedule twenty seven hours of work per week, and the rest of yep. flex time. And, that makes more sense. Yeah, and then if you if you actually end up having like all your flex time left over every week, you could have a more aggressive buffer, like a smaller buffer. But what a lot of people find is they don't end up with like any flex time left over. They're still busy, which yeah. means they actually need an even bigger buffer or um, better time estimates or something. Yeah, but just thinking, even the like tracking uh, how much time you spend on stuff is a difficult problem that like I don't do it to a sufficient resolution. Yeah. Time tracking is hard, but you can you can still get an overall picture. Just like, am I running out of time? Even if you don't know where the time went. Yeah. It might be easier in um in corporate stuff as well, or like work stuff where like calendar bookings and things are more common. But yeah. Um, um and then so about flex time. In the goal. Uh, when they have a buffer on the on a, a a workstation in a plant, people worry about like won't people be sitting there idle, like wasting their time? Like the people at this particular workstation are just waiting and they don't have work all the time, right? Yep. And I remember that. The yeah. answer was that often it's not even worth having them go multitask and do something else because then they might come back late and. You know, sometimes it's worth just eating the overhead. Yeah. Because uh, this stuff is so important. But with um with your own personal schedule, I don't think that's an issue. Like, I don't think that you have to worry about just wasting the time. Um, it's not that hard to come up with flex projects that are easy to do on a, you know, I have an hour here, I could read a book. Um. You know, whenever you have that spare time, you can probably find something to do with it. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. Well, I mean, even in even in a case like the goal, 
uh, you know, the misconception that like paying people and them not doing anything with their time is bad. Uh, like, I mean, I guess what I was saying was, I think that's a misconception. So it's not even true in the case of the goal. It's just a thing that looks bad on paper because of the way it's written down. Um, but we don't have to worry about that with personal time. Yeah, I also think in the goal, there's things they could have done if they wanted to save that time. There's So you can find ways of multitasking that are very easy to interrupt and you're not going to be late. Like, So if they have to leave the room, that's risky or they might come back at the wrong time and miss something. Um, but it's easy for them to multitask listening to an audiobook or a podcast or something. Um, and then the question is, how do you get business benefit from that, you know, rather than, than them getting personal time? And a lot of businesses are just like, whatever, they can have personal time. Um, they'll probably accept a lower salary if we're flexible about that stuff. You know, it kind of evens out in a way. But um, you could begin with, like, having them read business books and get better at their job in their downtime. You know, and yeah. that... It's not that hard to come up with some reasonably relevant things to do. Even just like maintenance of the machine. Like if you know that it's not going to be required for two hours, um, you know, can you, you know, resurface a part or apply oil or something like that? Like there's, there's other stuff to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. Also in the goal, once they had the, the extra idle time, they started doing more setups. They started spending some of it. They're like, oh, now that we have this time available, we can actually come up with a useful thing for the company which is having smaller batch sizes. Yep. So there's, to some extent, you free up resources and then you don't immediately use them and then, you know, give it a month and you'll probably figure out a use for it. Yeah, that is, like, I do find people, like, or at least I find, but people don't like sitting around doing nothing. Um, it's different from, like, taking a break after working hard or whatever else, but, um, but yeah, people do, don't enjoy the feeling of being idle in general they want to yeah. find stuff to do they're also worried they'll get fired like if my job isn't needed then they're probably going to start laying people off yeah um I'm not so sure about like manufacturing stuff particularly because you might like if you have a setup that needs three people then if they're idle for 15 minutes every hour you can't really like you know fire one to make up for it or every, idle 20 minutes every hour um, um yeah, but if they're so if they weren't idle in the past and now they're idle, they're going to think our plant is producing less, so layoffs are coming because we're doing bad. Like the whole oh, company okay, yeah, is yeah. losing money. We're we we must have lowered our production by twenty five percent. Um we must not be getting enough customer orders. I might need a new job soon. Yeah. No, that's true. Um this actually sort of raises an interesting point. Uh like a good solution for them in that sort of case is to actually like, you know, to do something like reading the goal, um, to like learn about the business side of things to like correct that misconception that they're, that things are worse because they've got idle time. Um, there's a really strong, uh, or people are strongly opposed. It feels like, uh, so say for example, like programmers are strongly opposed to learning about project management, um, is one example that I definitely have found. Uh, which I thought was incredibly silly because like, as like, you know, if you're working in a team of programmers, then project management is like an essential part of how the project happens. And you can either like have a good understanding of what is going on there and be more effective in any stuff that relates to project management or, you know, keep a lack of an understanding and how is that actually making anything better? Uh, and yet people don't seem to want to learn anything about it. There's some caveats to that like scrum and stuff and agile things people seem a little bit more open to learning about those systems but even then like i mean i've met yeah multiple project managers where i know more about project management or software uh, software project management than they do which is yeah disappointing a lot of people just aren't that great at their jobs and i think project manager is one where it has a lot of soft skills it's it's easier to be like a fraud than as a programmer or a, a physicist um, a project manager once told me that it didn't matter if people were bad at their jobs, we had to respect it was their job and not, like, be critical or uh, step on their toes or things like that. Yeah, that um, sounds like they think their job is more about social dynamics and peacemaking and so on than about any sort of hard skills about actually organizing time and resources. 
Yeah. Yep. Well, I don't think they were very good at their job, but um, so it sort yeah, of makes sense yeah. for people who aren't good at to find something that they're better at. Um, that sort of brings up an interesting point though about so say take a corporate culture where, uh, like people seem to generally agree that like politicking goes on in corporate culture. Um, so in some ways, is not the job of a project manager or manager about that stuff. Um, yeah, so like what's one the... of one of their jobs is to deal with politics and to shield their team from it. Like, hmm. if the programmer nerds don't have to worry about politics because their PM has their back, and he will go do all the political fights for them, not just for himself, but like getting them raises and recognition and whatever, and protecting them from red tape and so on. If he'll do all that stuff for them, it will help their productivity, and then they'll all benefit. Yeah. Um... I'm not sure about your experience, but mine has been uh, a little, like, almost the opposite in terms of the PM, uh, like, pointing out the red tape and, like, making it more of an issue, not less. Sort of feels yeah, yeah, inverted. I don't, I don't have experience with PMs. I've mostly only worked on tiny teams. Yeah. Um, I presume uh, not just tiny teams, but tiny teams in smaller organizations as opposed to... Yes. Yep. Yeah. Tiny yeah. teams no, in definitely... small companies. Um, I've definitely found in... Yeah, this is yeah definitely a larger company thing. Um, partially because like people's life at the company goes way beyond their life in any particular role. Uh, like They've got more to look out for than their current job. Um, I think that's part of the problem. Whereas in a smaller company, often like your role is the only role you'll ever have at that job, um, at that company. Um, there's maybe some caveats with growing companies and stuff, but um, right, yeah, but yeah, yeah. I haven't even had um, coding colleagues for years. Only solo coding. Fair enough. It's um. I deal with Definitely other people's code indirectly, that. but we didn't like collaborate on features or anything. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. But sometimes I get to see the outsourced mess of bugs that was created <laughs> months ago. Yeah, yeah, that's that's always fun to deal with. Um. Okay, so don't be afraid to have too much flex time, especially early on. Um, you know, you want to aim for uh, extra flex time rather than too little or none initially, and then you can tone it down later, which is better than being overbooked and trying to tone your schedule down. It's easier to tone your flex time downwards than your schedule. Yeah. In other words, it's easier to add things to your schedule than to subtract them. So you want to tend towards not having too many on your schedule in the first place. Yep. Um, I feel like, yeah, even less than two thirds, like 50% is probably a good place for me to start. Um, particularly because of the, the negative interaction with uh, estimates. Yeah. Yeah. If your estimates are not very good, then you need a larger buffer. So yep. one third buffer is, yeah, it relies on the estimates being decent. Well, I think in, However, um, oh, yep. it, it relies on um, estimates that have a 50% chance of being correct. So you don't have to pad them with a bunch of safety to have like a 90% chance of being done on time. Um, it is expected that some things will go over, but some things will go under. And if it's about half and half, it should roughly cancel out. Yeah. Whereas if, that, um, if you finish on time like 10% of the time, then you either need larger estimates or a lot more buffer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think in, I'm trying to remember critical chain in the background here, um, but I think one of the things they do is their estimates are often, uh, maybe maybe I'm wrong about this, but the estimates are like an amalgamation of lots of different estimates. Um, like one team over here and like manufacturing the molds for the modems and whatever over there and stuff like that. And so uh, like with just a increased sample size for taking estimates and stuff, um, I imagine that, yeah, you get 
closer to a real estimate um, as opposed to one source for all estimates can have a systemic problem. Yeah, like there, being... there could be an effect there. Um, but yeah. One of the things that I do sort of like worry about with whenever I think about this sort of stuff is like uh, what I've already committed to. Um, right. Which I'm not in a bad position with that at the moment. I've been in much worse positions. But um, yeah, and you want to be is, careful yeah. making commitments unless you actually have a pretty good understanding of how much time they'll take and how much time you're currently spending on various priorities. And if you're not sure, then you want to want to scale it down and ramp up gradually, if possible. So you can see what actually fits. Yeah. Um. One one of the best things to do with flex time is just taking stock of your situation, like remembering what your goals are, um, looking at your schedule document, like marking how far you are on your tasks, like seeing how it's going, estimating what your buffers are looking like, and you know, am I going to be behind this week or am I going to have some spare time at the end of the week? Um, yeah, you can spend time on that kind of stuff when you have a few minutes. Yeah. No, that is that is not a pretty good use. Right. And if you're busy enough that you find you don't have time to do that, then you're too busy. Yeah. I do, I do do this to some extent already, which is sort of good. Um, Usually stuff like um like earlier in the morning when I'm before I've like woken up properly and stuff like that. I'll occasionally do this sort of thing, which is good. Before I start. Not I mean, well not really. I don't like, you know, estimate against buffers or like, you know, evaluate that sort of thing. And often I don't have a scheduling doc. Because there's you know, everything's a bit uh loose. But I do like review like goals or timelines or stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, so that was about spaced repetition and reviewing things and also finding time and treating FI as semi-urgent. Yep. Uh, let's see what else is here. Flux stocks. Better writing. Reading habit, discussion capability, quality, leading. Oh yeah, leading. Okay, so there's there's two main different parts that go into leading discussions. There's the uh, the objective part and the social part. Yep. Right. So I have a bunch of ideas about the objective part. I tend to uh, refuse to do the social part particularly well or in the ways people want or whatever. So if you want models for that kind of leadership, uh, you could look somewhere else. Uh, when when I mention like leading discussions, um, I guess I don't necessarily mean like, like uh, leadership in the social sense. Um, I more mean like uh, doing discussions well when... so. Uh, like doing discussions well when the other person isn't as good at doing discussions or isn't as knowledgeable about the subject, um, that sort of things. Uh, I don't know if that's maybe thinking about it as leading discussions is is not the right way to think about it. Um, okay. Regardless, it's it's pretty hard to get away from having some social aspects. Um, yeah. Like if you're trying to give people advice or ask them questions or tell them anything, um, there are issues like do they want to listen to you and are they willing to respond and pay attention to you and and so on. And if they dislike you, then they'll do those things worse or give bad answers or whatever. So when dealing with most people, you have to manage the social stuff at least some. Keep them like semi happy. Yeah. 
So the objective stuff is things like you can make a discussion tree. You can um, work with them in a collaborative way to uh, brainstorm different issues and questions, and then like go through and address some of them in the tree. And you can both be adding nodes and see what's going on and how some stuff is getting answered. And you can, in some cases, you'll be able to agree about the answer to a node. In other cases, you might disagree. And then you'll be able to make some nodes related to the disagreement and try to sort it out and give your reasons and so on. And what a lot of people think is when you disagree, sometimes you can find an answer that actually resolves the issue. And a lot of times you can't, and you just have to agree to disagree. Or you can make... Uh, you can make arguments that are not decisive, but they're meant to be persuasive in some way. They're supposed to make your side sound a bit better or more likely or something. And so you just throw out a bunch of arguments that don't like actually win the debate, but they sound kind of nice. And then if you do that, the other person might be persuaded. They might say, you know what? When I put all those things together, your side sounds better than my side now that I think about it. Sounds like it makes sense, uh, particularly when the other person, like for example, it doesn't make much sense to do that in a conversation with you compared to like a conversation with someone who believes in arguments of support. Um, yeah. For example. Uh, yeah. So that is a standard thing to do. But what's better if you can figure out how to do it is you can bring up decisive issues. You can say, you can look for uh, some issue where if it goes one way, they'll concede, and if it goes the other way, you'll concede. You can say, like, you know, if X was true, I would think I was wrong, um, whereas if Y is true, would you think you were wrong? You know, you can try to find some points of contention that could actually be argued and reach a decisive conclusion, and you can try to get some agreement on what points those are. It would actually lead to a conclusion. And if you're able to think of some that you know how to how to argue or establish or something, then you can actually convince them. Like first you get them to agree that if X was true, then their idea wouldn't work. And then also uh, you have a way of explaining to them that X is true. Like, you know, you have some documentation of it or something. Yeah. Um Um, one thing that sort of occurs to me, so I've said here, like both people could suggest an issue an, an idea that sort of fits that, uh, criteria. Um, I'm not sure if it's generally the case that there would be a common idea, which was disagreed on, um, that would be decisive. Like it'd be easy, like, oh, it, it seems easy to have a situation like, I think X is true and if x was false then i would change my mind uh but you and you and you think x is false but if x were true it wouldn't change your mind um and then you could have some y for which the you know inverse relationship is true um i don't know if it's yeah general that i mean it seems it seems sort of like natural that there would be some individual idea for which it's true for both of us not not that the idea is true, we both believe it's true, but that the relationship um, between whether it's correct or not and convincing us to change our mind um, is true. Does that make sense? Somewhat. It's a bit abstract, but I think in general, you're going to find a lot of issues you disagree about, and only some of them are going to be very effective for changing someone's mind. Some of them, like, if they're wrong about that, they'd be a bit surprised, but it's not going to change their mind about the main point. You have to find what are like the key issues that have to be addressed to change their mind. There's some stuff yeah. where they're like, even if you convince me about all that other stuff, I'd still be like, but what about this one? This is the one that's like really important to me that seems like it logically implies my conclusion. So unless someone gives an answer to that, like I couldn't change my mind no matter how many other uh, semi-related points you, you convince me of. So... 
often you can find something that is a key issue in both people's minds. Uh, and if you cannot, but the two people contradict each other, then there should be a key issue. So someone has some sort of misconception. Um, you're you're looking at the issues in like significantly different ways, and someone's way isn't is wrong in some way that's causing the key issues to look different. Yeah, that's um. So when I was thinking about this, uh, one thing that occurred to me was like, if there wasn't a common key issue between them, uh, then it's not the case that that it's impossible to like identify one. Um, it's just that the people like in the discussion aren't uh like looking at it the right way or haven't framed it in the right uh like in the right terms to be able to find the key issue um possibly like uh like if they were looking at uh something in different levels of emergence then their answer to like if it were wrong what would change your mind um then they could give you know answers that were like intimately related but didn't seem to be the same issue uh off the bat um but yeah i feel like like th theoretically there must be one then that like there must always be a single key issue that would change like either mind if it were agreed on yeah um, one of the ways you can try to get out of is with gold routes conflict clouds or evaporating clouds are you familiar with those uh no Okay, they're in It's Not Luck. Yeah, that's, um, I've seen uh, a little bit of what you've written on them. Yeah, I wrote this post with some explanation and examples in it. So I'll put this in tutoring. Um, but so this is one of the techniques you can use. There's also, Less Wrong has an idea called a double crux, which is related, it's, it basically, crux just means key issue, and double means for both people. So they have some articles about finding something that's a key issue for both sides to try to resolve disagreements. Yep. Yeah. No, this makes sense. Um... I mean, From what I've seen, yeah. their stuff is pretty basic, like, it doesn't have some amazing insight to it. It's just sort of like, try to do this. But there might be some good stuff mixed in. I haven't read it all carefully. Um, they like their fancy words. Oh, yeah, some of them definitely do. Well, there was, I think the second result on Google was a contra double crux. Um. Mm hmm. Oops. So yeah, stuff yeah. like this, they're like good faith, epistemic humility, like it's decent stuff. Um, a lot of people do worse than that. Yeah. Um, I think it's... Uh, a lot of them do thing worse like, than that. They're, they don't quite know how to live up to it. Yeah, well this was the thing that sort of, as I was looking at that, that I, like that occurred to me, is that I think the way that most people read like these terms, like epistemic humility, I sort of uh, take as like a Socratic ignorance sort of thing, or a belief in your own ignorance in like the Socratic sense. Um, uh, but when you use the word humility, I think it triggers a bunch of stuff in people um, that is not similar to that. Um, and then there's like good faith again, which in terms of like truth seeking means something different to the social sort of interpretation. Um, Confidence in the existence of objective truth. I mean, I, I feel like there have been people we've talked to at Less Wrong who maybe don't agree with that. Um, yeah, I mean, Less Wrong is a it's a very sort of scattered community. It's not like everyone agrees with all the ideas. And this is not a uh, this is not a canonical thing. Like this is an article some guy wrote. Not everyone has read it. Not everyone agrees with it. There's like a lack of common themes at their site is a bit of a problem. Um, but what I was going to mention is actually. Um, Yudkowsky, in his book, attacks humility quite a bit. Uh, he has an article called The Sin of Underconfidence. And there, it comes up in other articles where he says humility is, in certain ways, over overrated and causes problems. So I thought when they said, like, 
epistemic humility is super, super important in some other words. Um, that was sort of notable. It reminded me. Interesting. Um, because their own sequences um, tell you that there are major caveats and you can be too humble. Does... Uh, how does this line up with, um, like, listening to the choice the other day, the phrase um, humble arrogance, I think they use, uh, or um, Efrat uses in the choice. Uh, yeah, does does Yudkowsky's idea line up with that, or is it... Uh, like I don't remember that to some in degree? detail enough. Yeah, okay. Um, I think yeah, he might have like... been mostly talking about something different than the choice. That would be my first guess. Oh, Yudkowsky was talking about something different. Yeah. He talks about being too yeah. modest. That's a common phrasing as well. Um... And I, th I think there was something to what he was saying. Um, I think I've had issues with that as well, like... Not understanding my place in the world properly causes problems. Like, having mm. incorrect expectations about how good people are relative to my skill level causes problems, and there's, there's various things. Yeah. And I think... A good way to look at it is accuracy is important. Um, you can't just be like, I'll be underconfident so that I'm definitely not overconfident. Like, you just want accuracy. There's no easy way out here. Um, just being super humble does not make everything go great. Yeah, no, I agree. A lot of people are super humble dishonestly just because it's like socially safer, which is also not a good system. I think it's often like expected. Um... Yeah, it is. There's a lot of pressure on it. Yeah. There's also a lot of... Um, Patio11 tweeted about this the other day. There's a lot of praise for ambition in the abstract, but if you... If you're actually ambitious about a specific concrete thing, people will often attack you. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. I haven't thought about that particularly. Um... I don't think it was from that thread. Um, oh, you yeah, know, this was positive. just the easiest way that I could. I don't think it was either. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I think it was within the last week. I don't know how easy to find. Uh, he seems well. He's a pretty prolific poster sometimes. So I would search for the word ambition. I think I think that's probably in it, but I'm not certain. Um, I might have to. Does tweets and replies show all of the tweets and replies? Yeah, you shouldn't need that. I think. Um, no, I need to scroll down a whole bunch to get the auto load though. Yeah, Twitter's fucking terrible. Um, I'm not sure if um, if uh, replies to your own stuff, like in a tweet thread, show up in the normal tweets thing. I think they do. Not sure. I think it's when like. When it, when it doesn't, like, load properly, I don't know if it's actually, like, control effable. It's not. Like, oh, and this, right? So I clicked show this thread. There was, like, a dot, dot, dot. Yeah, so there were, like, five of his tweets that were It hidden. was collapsing it? That sucks. Yeah, I don't actually know how to... Twitter's so bad. It's like... From these accounts, at your eleven. Okay, every time I click on this, it scrolls me down. Ambition. Here it is. I found it. October first. Oh, ten days ago. Thirteen a week wouldn't have worked. But yeah, you can be whatever you want, but actually mean when people are concretely ambitious. I guess he didn't explain it very much. Oh, he, there, here's an example. Kids wanting to be president, people are like, yay, ambition. But if you personally are like, I'm going to be the mayor, people are like, what are you talking about? You can't be mayor, blah, blah, blah. Yeah.
Does he um he doesn't say anything more about it, like in terms of why he thinks no, it happens? The thread end. Yeah, okay. Oh, he he's often, um, cool game stuff. He knows a lot of social dynamic stuff. But he often doesn't he says limited amounts of it and then stops. Um and he puts up with a lot of it. Like he's aware that some things suck and then puts up with them anyways and doesn't use the word suck or any synonyms. But he'll say it in a way where you can tell that he knows it's not optimal. And he sees what's yeah. going on enough to like see there's an issue there. So it's an unusual amount of insight for how okay with it he is. Most people with that much insight are like quite hostile to social stuff. Or at least public insight. I think there's a lot of people who put up with it and they keep their insights to themselves more. Yeah, yeah. It is, actually... It's hard for me to... Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, I was just going to say it's hard for me to gauge how much he actually puts up with social stuff uh, publicly. Like, you know, a lot of the time, it's not like there's... Uh, he doesn't seem to necessarily reply to stuff that people post and that sort of thing. But I just posted the quote the other day. I wonder if I put it in the wrong thread. Oh, you put it in mine, maybe. Oh, wait, no. Just wait. You're talking about this quote. No, I don't. Um, Different one. Put the I'll other thing in mine. Uh, archive. This paragraph is a good example. Uh, one way is the domain name sometimes open doors that it, the username does not. Oh, this is an article uh, about working at Stripe. What has working at Stripe been like? So the domain name is stripe.com, who he works for now. So as in having like the the email address at Stripe type thing, as opposed to yes. the username. And having a open. job title there. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it, well, he says an interesting change in his relationship, which apparently is just knowing more venture capitalists and treating as more professional. Um, professional thing, I think, I presume, is the interesting part, considering he says, despite no obvious change in skill. Right. So he's saying that he has a prestige tag associated with him, and then people are treating him quite differently um, in a way unrelated to merit, and he noticed and said it doesn't feel great to him, um, but he totally puts up with it. Yeah, yep. Yeah. No, that's... um. That's the world is like know. this, but most people don't say so. Like, most of the world is like this, but few people say so, and this causes a lot of trouble where most young people don't know what they're in for. Like, they sign up for job paths and life goals and so on without understanding that this is what it's going to be like. Yeah, I, f I feel like there is some broader acknowledgement of it in particular, uh, like, well, in particular career paths particularly, but other segments maybe as well. Um, like, uh, in law, like, you know, you, there's the expectation that you do a degree and you get your college of law, or at least in Australia, that's what it is. Sort of like sitting the bar exam or whatever, being admitted to the bar. Um, so you can practice after. Yeah, and... one of the things with degrees, no one ever told me when I was, I didn't particularly want to go to college, and people pressured me to go to college. But no one ever told, said to me, the reason you need to go to college is because people are irrational and unreasonable, and they'll judge you for whether you have the degree, not your merit. And they'll judge you mm. for how much of a social network you have. Like, you need to go to college to make friends with people that you can get jobs from your friends in the future, um, having a social network is more important than actually being good at your work. Like no, one, no one said it that way ever. Nothing like it. Like, so I was under the, the loose impression that what mattered is whether you could do the job. Um, I had no idea that most, most hirings, like the majority of hirings, are not cold hirings. You always hear about submitting your resumes. And yeah, I think majority of hirings are not just cold resume submissions. I have a, like, I haven't had a, I think I've had, like, one cold 
job sort of thing. And then everything else is just let on from like, or everything in that sort of thing let on from that. And otherwise I've never applied in a traditional sense. Um, I get occasionally asked for a resume, but that's usually so that someone can give it to someone else so that they're like, yeah, okay. I got it. Yeah. Um, I got, I got some work cold. Um, I had a very good rate of getting interviews from sending out resumes. And I got a, a long-term client hold um, pretty quickly, which worked out well for me. But it was not my first job, which is notable. And the first job was a blog reader hired me to code stuff. Yeah. And getting your foot in the door, like having work experience makes it significantly easier. Yeah. Um, I found as well, a lot of it is like with, uh, particularly with stuff like that, there'll be like networks of independent contractors, like these, you know, unofficial networks. Um, and people will throw each other work when they, you know, have stuff on at the moment. Um, and so a lot of stuff just comes through that. Um, it's my impression yeah. here, at least Australia. Yeah. Patio 11 talks about, um, you can make contact with people who work at companies and have coffee with them and suggest possibly that working there would work out well for both of you, you know, given that we had a nice conversation and we were both interested in it and, you know, maybe there's a way in there. And then you can get a, if they liked you, then they quite often will forward your name to HR or whatever. And then that's a non cold way to get in without, you don't need like a prior contact or whatever. But it's still a lot different than just sending your resume. Um, well, particularly as well when there's like referral bonuses and stuff. Um, yeah. 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 Um, I'm just going to take a quick break. I'll be back in a sec. Okay. So this was, I wrote this, well, I drafted it ages ago. I think I brought it up in one of the, one of our tutorials. I'm not sure when. Um, anyway, I sort of expanded a bit and fixed it up and whatever. Um, oh, the goal of a political party? Yeah, yeah. I think I've still got it in draft somewhere. Yeah, so it looks like two weeks ago, that's when I wrote it mostly. Um, I've changed it a bit since then, but basically the same. I don't know how interested you are in grammar errors, but uh, there some yeah. effort is an error. How, so, and they are some effort to maintain. How is that? Yeah, so, so it's equating they with effort. Um, it's linking verbing them together. It should be they take some effort to maintain. Oh, okay. 
or um, they are a hassle, like R should be linking to something that's equivalent. Um, that's, yeah, okay, so it wasn't that, like, it's there is not, like, that's not the grammatical thing, it's it's the oh, yeah. clause. The contraction's the fine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's the linking verb, but it's some effort is, um, I don't think it's a proper link, like, it's, it's not really the same thing, it's more of a... Um, I'm wondering whether there's a... I don't think some effort thing? is an attribute of um parties like they take or require some effort they cause the need for putting in effort but i don't think that effort is an attribute that the parties actually have in the same way that they have a uh, a number of members say um i'm wondering if there's uh like if i've conflated two different so we can talk about like an effort um in sort of like an enterprise um like this example this is part of an ongoing effort to develop the asian debt market um but using some as a modifier I'm, i don't think i can use that for a noun right um uh some um, marbles you can have some in front of noun uh yeah i'm just not sure about this this like arrangement Oh, um, so it's a non-count, but you can have, like, some sand, so there's some before a non-count. Uh, yeah, I could have, like, well, if I said, like, make some effort, make some effort, does that even work? Um, yeah, um, uh, like, the, the phrase some effort, I don't know, um, let me just... I think if you said parties are an effort, it would also have a similar problem. Um, it's making a party takes effort, or making a party is an effort, or running a party is an effort. But it's not the party itself isn't effort, directly or literally. I think this um, is informal, like I wouldn't be surprised to see other people say this. So... Uh, I've replaced it here just with, and they take some effort to maintain. Um, yeah. Which, yeah, makes sense. Um, I'm wondering whether, yeah, maybe there's like a colloquialism in British English or something like that. Um, no, I I think people in America would informally say something like this, some of them. Okay. I think it sounds okay because of the to maintain. Like, if you drop to maintain, it probably sounds quite informal to you. Political parties are some effort, right? That sounds yeah. at least informal. And then you add the yeah. to maintain, and it fixes it conceptually because what you understand it to mean is maintaining political parties takes effort. Yeah. Um, so you have all the words there to understand it. But... They're not put together properly because the to maintain is just a modifier that's tacked on. Yeah, no, this makes sense. Um, and I can see how, like, saying they are some effort is, like, yeah, equating the parties to the effort, um, which yeah. is not, yeah. Um, I mean, the other thing you could say, like, uh, and there is some effort involved in their maintenance would be, that feels grammatically correct. Right. Um, yeah, because now the verb is involved instead of are. Well, you have yeah. is involved, but you have an, the involved is different than that. You're linking them to involved via is. Is is not linking effort anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It's possible to do metaphorical links. But this doesn't read as a metaphor, like you're, the effort is, is literal that you have in mind. Yes. Um, anyway, yeah, that's an interesting, I didn't, well, it took me some, yeah, some time to spot it. Yeah, so it's meant to be literal effort, but parties aren't literally effort.
There's a missing that here. That is often optional, but it's pretty awkward to leave out with the double plural noun in a row. Yep. Um, no, and it looks wrong as soon as I read it. Um, that's been a common thing in, like, uh, I think for some time, maybe maybe I associate it with being fancier or something or more formal, um, to have, like, dropped that's uh where you end up with yeah two nouns next to each other yeah okay so the goal comes up after three paragraphs that's a bit of a delayed intro i think um i the initial uh so this the third paragraph is reworked a bit and the first two are expanded um I think it relies a lot on the oh. title. If they read the title, and they remember the title, then they know where you're going with these paragraphs. Which is not entirely reliable. People don't always pay attention to titles. Sometimes they think that the body stands on its own. It depends. Yeah. They definitely do notice titles part of the time. But, like, there's... Uh, most books and really a lot of articles, you can read the body without knowing what the title is and it works fine. The title is not always like the first header um, within the article itself, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So relying on it, um, some people will probably get confused. So I mean, I do like, uh, in the first paragraph there is like, uh, well, I guess the the goal that's mentioned in the like I've mentioned that there are goals also, well, but uh, I noticed that these the usage of goal here is not a primary focus of the sentence. Yeah, here's the topic sentence, um, which is this is not a good opener for an article unless this is actually what it's about. Like, here's all the ways that political parties take lots of resources. Like, if that was actually your theme, this would be a good opener, but it's not. So. This, the title itself has to be treated as the opener for this to work. So I initially had the first and second paragraph swapped, um, which yeah, so I didn't like. Oh, this yeah, one's not an opener either. Like, this is telling us what political parties are in Australia, which is yeah. also not going to be the theme of your article. It's not an educational article about the rules in Australia or something. Yep. It's fair to say a party, there's a missing that, that a party. This one's more, more optional, minor. Yep. It's somewhat stylistic whether to include that one. I'm on the, the heavy use of that side of things, um, because I favor being more explicit and clarity. Yeah, no, I am too if I stop to think about it. So this is a very vague topic sentence. A party can help achieve multiple goals. Um, and you don't really know what's going to be in the paragraph. That's another thing you could put in your spaced review is um, looking at topic sentences. Yep. And things like you can you should be able to make an outline from all the topic sentences and have it come out somewhat decent. And in reverse, you can write via first make an outline, then use every point in your outline as a topic sentence and then fill in the rest of each paragraph, and then you should come up with something that's reasonably well organized. Yeah, I feel like I need to make a checklist, um, or at least that would help a lot. Yeah, writing about the concepts you're learning and making summaries and bullet point checklists and so on of them 
are ways to understand them better and remember them better and they can ha and they can be practical things that you can review and a checklist is a particularly good form for quickly using You probably don't need a bullet point list if you only have two goals on it. It makes more sense when you get up to three or four. Yep. When there's only two things, it's not that hard to just put them into the paragraph, like, as, and it still won't even be a long paragraph. No, it's, yeah. Um, it also means okay. that instead of having, like, a single sentence bullet list and then, like, another paragraph, uh, it's just one contiguous paragraph. It'd be nicer. Yeah, so affect the policies enacted by legislatures. Uh, so this semicolon is an error. So semicolons need to join clauses, and commas uh, would be appropriate if you're joining phrases. But you can also join clauses with a comma and a conjunction. Um, so in this case, like what, what do you make of this part and highlight? Um, well, that that just feels like a. I mean, with the exception of the either at the start. Um, well, uh, uh, okay. So it's right. like you either can ignore the either preposition. And what what is this? I propose. You know, what's this part right here? Um, so that's, that's a prepositional phrase, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a modifier and then yeah. we have a, or, and then Which we have is, what's, what's this? Um, so, uh, I mean, we've got, uh, Garen preposition, um, Yeah, so I think this is it's, a noun it's the phrase. it's yeah, so it's missing so by would like I should put by um yes. before that as well. Um Yeah. It's um Yes. So you have an implied repeated word and if you ignore that, what you have is a noun phrase, as you said a garand. Um and then if you add the preposition, then you get a modifier again, because it becomes a prepositional phrase. Yep. So, what we do not have here is a clause. There's no verb. And what, when we have the prepositions, we actually just have modifiers, not even nouns. Although there's the either that we didn't deal with. But anyways, there's definitely no verb. So this stuff is not a, uh, this is not a clause. It could not be its own sentence. Make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah. When you have a semicolon, you need clauses on both sides. In yes, general. yep. Um, I think I could use, uh, like I could, like it could be a parenthetical, right? Um, you know, obviously it, not with the grammar I put there, but, um, like, uh, that second section I could have put in parens, um, not yeah. the semicolon though. I think just a comma here is fine. Well, depending on where I put the by, um, a comma doesn't necessarily make sense. So like here I've got change it to like affect the policies enacted by legislatures by either proposing new legislation or participating in voting oh. on which yeah, I meant in the original you can switch this to a oh yeah oh yeah yeah um I'm not sure if there's uh any good uh principles around whether whether the, like a preposition like by here should be before or after the either or inside of outside of the conjoining. So you need a uh, comma, this version. Okay. Come after All legislatures. Right. So, but in this version, a co obviously a comma right. doesn't. In work this version, by. you don't need a comma because now you have by making a prepositional phrase to modify legislatures. 
So you don't use a comma to separate the the modifier from the thing it's modifying. Um, yeah. Uh, whereas, did I need the comma in the other one? Why did I need the comma in legislatures either by? Uh, I can tell you intuitively you definitely need that comma, but I'm not super familiar with the word either and exactly how it works, so it's hard to give you the exact reason. Yeah, I've, I've um, tried to tone down my comma usage because I think I was overusing them before, and... Uh, I know that there are cases where I put them in the, when they were wrong. There's some cases where I put them in and they were optional, but I don't think there are many cases where I've taken them out and they were required. Um, I guess, yeah. Um, get one particular person or a group of people elected. Okay, so causing elections or affecting policies. Those are your two reasons. Yep. Those goals, my first impression of them is that they're they're trying to affect the system in a big way. And the system is not set up to let random people affect it. Like, it's quite hostile to non-elites having control over such things. Um, yeah, there's... So in Australia, we've got a, a slightly more diverse political landscape. Like, there's, there's multiple minor parties and stuff that do play a role. Um, so that's, yeah. uh, I guess, a contextual thing. But the... Uh, even, like... So while most like most parties fail um most parties don't even last a, a one cycle sort of thing before they deregister um uh or one or two but um so most stuff fails however uh in terms of like actually affecting these things it's if you did want to do it with the exception of like lobbying uh there's no other real way there's no way to do it directly besides doing this um right essence, um Broadly, I don't think it should be done directly. There's a there's a chronic problem, a major problem. It's causing effects on a recurring basis over time. One needs to deal with the root cause. Mm. So, uh, yeah, I mean, like, I agree. Um, but I don't think that necessarily changes uh, what goals are political parties uniquely suited to meet. Oh, yeah. That was more a comment on, I question those yeah. goals, but yes, that is um, what political parties are for. Like, if you want to educate people, a political party is not the ideal uh, way of organizing that effort. Yeah, and if you individually want to do these things, then there are better ways of doing it. Um, or, you know, joining a party as opposed to creating one or whatever else. Um, yeah, I guess this is this is from the point of view of, like, given that you have a party, or given that a party exists, um, what are the reasons for it existing sort of thing? Um, actually, I'm not sure about that, but um, that's sort of at least close to the intent. Okay, so you told us what the goals are, then you said that they can do other goals too. They're just not uniquely suited for them. What's the decisive reason for starting a party? It needs to be something they're uniquely suited for, no comparable method. A core goal of a political party must then be to affect elections. A political party which does not contribute to particular candidates being elected is not very good. Okay. So, I think I got the main point. 
this is a bit of a weak ending, like not very good. Is uh, it's not strong phrasing, and that doesn't work well for your conclusion of your whole essay. Yeah, no, I felt one of the reasons that I didn't publish it initially was um, because I didn't feel like this end bit made much sense. Um, well, not not made. It, it does make sense, but just that it it felt incomplete. I guess that once I wrote this, I didn't really know what to say. Yeah, so there's a variety of places you could take this. Like, you could talk about um, misconceptions. Um, what else do people think political parties' goals are, and how does this lead to trouble, and how does knowing this lead to better organization and better results and better marketing and communication with members and so on? And better decisions about whether a political party is right for you. Yeah. So those things would help with uh, what is the impact of this? Why does it matter to know this particular thing? It's a little unfocused because it's sort of like parties have downsides, but what's the goal? What's the upside? But it doesn't quite say that. And then it says two goals, and then it switches again, and it says they can do other things too, which is... um not sticking to the main focus of what are these two goals, what matters about them, what should I know about them. Like it seemed like the, the two goals were going to be the main thing in the article, then a lot of the paragraphs weren't especially about them. Like this paragraph here isn't really about them. And this one is about like multi-purposeness for some reason. And multi-purposeness is sort of a like a meta level or an abstract theory of how to look at things, whereas these are two concrete goals. And I was expecting more about the concrete goals. Or if you want the article to be really abstract and not really to be about these particular goals and more about methodology, you could clarify that. The title makes it sound concrete. Like, what is the goal? Like, we're going to get a specific yeah. answer and it's going to be about that. Um, this is so this is good. Um, one of the so this is meant to be the sort of thing that uh like starts to contribute to a library of criticism um that is meant to sort of i don't know i guess be more foundational stuff it's not meant to necessarily answer anything in and of itself it's meant to be a general resource um yeah so i think you might do better to start that with bullet point writing um you might have an easier time expressing what your point is if you Cut most of the paragraphs and just said, like, here's what Flux thinks the goal of a political party is, like, goal number one, and goal number two. And just keep it really simple and, like, get the info across as your main focus instead of trying to make it elegant or something. And then, um, after you've had that up for a while and gotten feedback and criticism and thought it over for a while and organized your thoughts and all that stuff, if you still think it's good at that point, then you go and write an essay and make a you know a better version because it's more stable at that point. As in, um, getting feedback on like after it's been up and I've got feedback like on the bullet point sort of version, on the yes, yeah, yeah okay. So you you like present the ideas in a more bare form, then, uh, you know, if you become confident of them, um, and they stand the test of time more, then maybe you write the article. Yeah, okay. One of the things that'll happen is you'll see like which ones you link people to more often or less often. So you'll get an idea of which ones come up a lot, which ones are important to focus on. Which ones do people have questions about or object to? Um yeah, this um makes me think of like a um essentially like a library of criticism having two tiers where you have uh like a lower quality stuff or lower um fleshed out stuff uh in that sort of early bullet pointy type form um and then higher quality stuff that yeah 
you put a lot of effort into writing an essay that's more polished because it's going to, because you, well, you've got more confidence. It'll stand the test of time, but also that it's right. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that'll help with focus because you'll have a you need a better idea of what problems your audience is interested in, what they're confused by, what they want to know, like what are their frequently asked questions. Um, this when I read this, it doesn't seem like ten people asked you the same thing and you're writing a response. Um, you know, no, it doesn't there are... seem like you know your audience and have a really clear goal on what you want to tell them that will fix a real problem. Um, yeah, so there is like, in general, there's a lot of disagreement about this stuff. Like this is the, the problem of, um, not being aligned on this is like, has been somewhat of a persistent one. Uh, but it's one of those things where it feels like everyone has slightly different reasons for, or there's no alignment right. on anything else that would fit there either. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is sort of indirectly responding to people. It's in the ballpark of what a lot of people have said to you, um, but yeah. it's not a clear, direct response to them. So one of the things with bullet points is you can respond to everyone a lot faster. Like you can go through, you said there are a bunch of variations, so you could go and take like a dozen different things people have said and have one bullet point as an answer to each one, as well as a few about your idea, or your claim. Yep. Um, and then you can see which of those end up being the most important and like you, know, you might find that some of those points never come up and they're really minor and other ones if you explain like these three then people see your point and it sort of covers the rival theories well enough yeah um, I think that's one of the reasons the article seems unfocused and things uh, and I have those like uh, two paragraphs like before and after the goals that are sort of not about the goals um, is because those paragraphs are like trying to like in a sort of soft way be that general response to competing theories. Yeah. Like the stuff about background goals and whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's awkward for me because I'm not familiar enough with the competing theories. So it's hard for me to see like exactly what you're answering and how you're answering. Yeah. Because you don't provide the background on who you're arguing with. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. I think I've got a uh, incomplete mental model of how to fit like ideas into an essay, or maybe like what to exclude as well, like what either deserves its own topic or like a different section or stuff like that. Yeah, if you want to write an essay, I would say write an outline first. Yeah. And then try to figure out what should be included and how to focus it at the outline stage. Like, do all these points fit together? And is there a progression? Are they in an order that makes sense? Do they all follow a theme? You can do all of that at the outline stage. And then where you just sort of have one sentence per idea and then turn every sentence into a paragraph, turn it into a full article. Yep. And so it's easier to write step by step instead of skipping straight to the end product of the, the whole article. I think that's maybe, yeah, like, or it relates to some of the problems we were talking about earlier. Um, uh, well, both lack of practice, not doing, uh, like not using the techniques that we've practiced and, um, uh, the sort of laziness or regression sort of stuff. This is, this sort of wraps up or is an example of all those things. Yeah. I know someone who has a policy that you have to submit an outline with your article or he doesn't want to give you writing feedback if there's no outline. That seems uh, reasonable. He's, he's had a lot of trouble with unfocused articles, and it's hard to figure out what the point is and what's going on. And uh, you know, getting people to write outlines gets 
better articles in the first place is also and also easier to respond and you can see things like you can look does the outline make sense and if so does the article actually follow it and fit with it and so on you can compare the two mm. no i think that's sort of a um yeah there's a lot of good things about that policy I should mention that, like, I mean, as a, like, an author, I think, well, at least me, um, like, I'll, even just, yeah, a lot of the problems that I sort of feel exist but don't quite know how to nail down before, uh, like, after writing something like this would be solved if I'd just written an outline. Either, even writing an outline after the fact is fine in the sense that um, it'll point out the weird bits of the essay that need reorganizational cutting or whatever else um maybe not as good as writing it beforehand but yeah yeah and also in the outlining phase you can brainstorm a bunch of things you could potentially include and then you take the whole list and you criticize it and you go through it and say this is less important this one's wrong etc and you narrow it down uh, and try to find the, the key points or the most important things or the things that uh, fit together thematically so you brainstorm like way more points that could go in your outline than you actually end up using. And that tends to raise the quality than if you just brainstorm and then use whatever you came up with. You want to have a bunch yeah. of extras and then roll them out. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I agree. Um, all right, we're close to the hour. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking about stuff to do between now and then. I feel like one of the things that makes a lot of sense uh, was um, like, you know, one of the problems I mentioned was not writing enough or whatever and not practicing. Um, we talked about a bunch of stuff and then a bunch of philosophy topics. Uh, anyway, yeah, a way to solve multiple issues is I should write on some of these um, or write about some of these. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, Yeah, I'm wondering, so I'm just thinking whether I should, like, so I think I'm going to try and write more than I usually would, even if there's a bunch of stuff that's crap. Um, we don't have to spend any time on it if I know it's crap, but just the... Um, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, getting stuff out of my head and clear and figuring out what I do and don't recall and stuff like that. Yeah, it's good to, to write it down and see how crap it is. Or isn't. It gives you feedback on your own knowledge. Like, if you write it and it comes out crap, you can try again and again until you got one that's not crap, and then you're like, okay, maybe I'm starting to get it. And then there's yep. there's going to be some other topic where you write it the first time and you're like, this is okay, this makes sense. Like, I think it was more coherent in my head when I started already compared to that other one. Yeah. Yeah. And there will be variants. It's not a... It's not a guaranteed metric. Like sometimes writing will come out crap, even if you understand what you're doing, and vice versa. There's some variance, but it still is a decent indicator. Yes. Yep. Yep. And if you um if you if you're worried about variance, you can just retry. And well, yeah, I've got. If you do it a few times, you'll get the patterns better. It's effectively four days between now and Friday, so uh, plenty of opportunities to retry. We'll write multiple things. Cool. All right. Um, should we leave it there? Okay. Yeah. See you next Sweet. time. See you in a few days. Bye.